This should be true. I think we all understand this by now. God keeps his promises, doesn't he? God keeps his word, and he keeps his word despite the recklessness of man. Has it fully dawned on everyone yet that Abraham and his descendants made some pretty major mistakes? I think that should be clear by now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. And yet God kept all the promises that he made to those people. Why? Because God is faithful. Can't get around that, can we? He keeps his promises. What sets Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob apart from most people of all time? Have you really stopped to consider that? They made mistakes. We make mistakes. What, what sets them apart, really? The fact is, these people didn't let their mistakes ruin their promises. God can use anyone at any time for any purpose that he sees fit. But let me tell you the easy way. The easy way is to do it God's way first. And if we'll do it God's way first, we won't make such a mess of our lives and then feel like we've got to make a tough decision when really it's an easy decision. Do what God says. God's going to keep his promises. We're talking about people of the Pentateuch, and tonight we're going to talk about Jacob and Esau. But we're going to start with Esau. First, we're going to talk about Esau, the red and hairy man who sold his birthright for one morsel of meat. Then we're going to talk about Jacob, the plain and smooth man who wrestled with a man who was, believe it or not, more than a man. And then third, we're going to get to lessons for today. Are there any beneficial lessons from any of these Old Testament characters? I'm going to assert that the answer is yes, absolutely. So open your Bibles with me to Genesis 25, and that's probably where we'll begin. Let's begin talking about Esau. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to give Esau's lineage. We're going to talk about Esau's life. So there will be several sub-points under these things, but you'll see that they're pretty similar. So first, let's talk about Esau's lineage. Who was his father? Look at Genesis 25 and verse 28, and we'll get an answer to really his father and his mother, specifically in this context. And Isaac... There's Esau's father. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, we've talked about Isaac, and we understand that Isaac was a little passive. Now, the text tells us that Isaac loved Esau, so Esau's father was Isaac. Isaac was a passive man. Perhaps, and that's the best we could do, is that perhaps Isaac had his eyes set toward Esau because he saw the aggressiveness in Esau that he wished he had in himself, but he really didn't. So Esau's father was Isaac, but who was his mother? Well, the text told us. The text says that Esau's mother was Rebekah. Now, the text also said that Rebekah loved Jacob. Jacob and Esau were twin boys. Esau was the firstborn. So perhaps Rebekah loved Jacob, because she saw so much of his father Isaac in him. Now, those are just guesses, but the fact is Esau's lineage goes back to Isaac and Rebekah. But now, who were Esau's wives? Look at Genesis 26, verses 34 and 35. Esau had more than one wife. Genesis 26, 34, and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashamath, I suppose that would be one way to say this female's name, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, now look what the text says, which were grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. When you look at Genesis 36, 1 through 3, it seems that Esau had at least three wives but he perhaps had as many as four. You can compare and contrast this with, that is Genesis 26, 34, and 35, with Genesis 36, 1 through 3, and you count how many he had. But here's the point. All his wives, in one way or another, whether it was three, four, five, however many he had, were a grief of mind. He did not marry good women. Now, speaking of Genesis 36, go ahead and turn there because we're going to see quickly Esau's children. 
as in his descendants. Now, we're not going to read most of this, but I can tell you that Genesis 36 is not a meaningless list of names. Among other things, it makes it very clear that the Messiah did not come through Esau. Now, observe for the sake of time Genesis 36 and verse 8. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Now look, look. Esau is Edom. Look at verse 43. Duke. You see a lot of Duke in this chapter, meaning chief. Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram, these be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. So Esau is Edom. Esau is the father of the Edomites. Now who were the Edomites? Let's put it very simply. The Edomites were a troublesome people and a bad influence on the children of Israel. Well, how did they influence them? Look at Genesis 36 and verse 31. And these are the kings. Observe that. These are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. That should bring to everybody's mind 1 Samuel 8. Do you remember they rejected the judges? And what did they say, the children of Israel? We want us a king. We want us a king like who? We want to have a king over us like everybody around us. Well, who was around them? The Edomites. Well, who were the Edomites? The descendants of Esau. Now, there's a brief look at his lineage Let's talk briefly about his life. Perhaps the best way to describe Esau is short-tempered. Well, what do you mean? Esau needed everything right now. I got to have it right now. I need it. Instant, instant, right now. Got to have it. Sound like anybody else you've never met in your life? Surely not. But I do want to suggest three other things to you in addition to being short-tempered. Esau was, number one, short-sighted. Turn with me to Genesis 25. Let's try to determine some things here about Esau. Esau was short-sighted. He sold his birthright. Look at Genesis 25, beginning in verse 29. The Bible says, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Apparently the root name of, or the root meaning behind Esau and Edom is red. Apparently. Verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now we, we read that and we say birthright. What is that? Well, Esau was the firstborn of Isaac. Is that correct? Yeah, he was the first of these twin boys. And the birthright entailed at least three important things. Number one was authority. There was authority with the birthright. But number two, there was a double portion of the property. Just look at it like this. Had three children. Let's just say there's three children. You would divide the property by four. Three children, divide it by four, and the oldest would receive two-fourths. Do sat down, he would receive half. So he received a double portion of the property. That is the firstborn with the birthright. And then third, the birthright also entailed becoming the priest of the family. We're still here in the time of patriarchy. That is father ruled who would have been the priest offering sacrifices, as it seems, on behalf of his whole family. So what does Jacob say? Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. There's a spiritual significance to this. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Esau was short-sighted. He wasn't thinking ahead, big picture, here he is, a cunning man of the field, a hunter, and he says, I'm about to starve to death, basically, which is a little bit of an exaggeration. And Jacob said, verse 33, swear to me this day, and he, Esau, swear unto him, Jacob, and he, Esau, sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, look at what Moses writes by inspiration. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Not only was Esau short-tempered and short-sighted, Esau was also spiteful. Look at Genesis 27 and verse 41. Esau's already sold his birthright, and in principle he sort of gets swindled out of it, but that's we'll talk about that more with Jacob. But Genesis 27 and 41 says, And Esau hated Jacob 
because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. They were a little off on that at hand there. He, he still lived quite some time. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. That's a pretty spiteful statement, wouldn't you say? You sold your birthright, now you're mad at your brother, and then you're going to offer death threats? That's a pretty spiteful person. But Esau was also sinful. The New Testament text of Hebrews 12, 16 and 17, Esau was most clearly a profane person, and it clearly shows in his descendants the Edomites. Read the book of Obadiah at your leisure and list, just go through that one chapter book of the Old Testament, which is addressed to Edom, and list the sins that are mentioned among those people. They were an exceedingly wicked people. So don't you see now how that God made the right choice? God made the right choice with Abraham. God made the right choice with Isaac. And God made the right choice with Jacob. Even when we read in the book of Malachi, the first two or three verses, something along the lines of, Jacob have I loved... But Esau have I hated. Those are not with regard to the individuals. Those two individuals ended up representing two nations. Jacob ended up representing Israel, and Esau ended up representing Edom. God made the right choice. Now, second, let's talk about Jacob. Jacob, the plain and smooth man who wrestled with a man who was more than a man. Let's do him the same way. Let's talk about his lineage. Let's talk about his life, and we'll do it in very similar fashion. Go with me back to Genesis 25. Let's read a little extended passage of scripture here. Let's determine his father. Who was Jacob's father? Well, we understand, but let's just read. Genesis 25, beginning in verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Sound familiar? And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children, plurality in this instance, struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Perhaps she inquired of the Lord through a prophet of some sort. Perhaps. Maybe she went directly to the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Now look, Two nations, two nations, observe that, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his heel, or his hand rather, took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them, and the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. So, in looking at Jacob's lineage, is it not exactly the same as Esau's? His father was Isaac, and his mother was Rebekah. Now recall that Isaac was passive, peaceable, plain, prosperous. Remember all those things from last week? And his mother, Rebekah, was a good person in her own right too. But what did we already notice about Genesis 25 and verse 28? We already see favoritism beginning to rear its ugly head, don't we? And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But in contrast to that, Rebekah loved Jacob. So Jacob's lineage, his father is Isaac, his mother is Rebekah. Now what about his wives? I can find where Jacob had at least four wives. I'm beginning to see some problems here among these people, aren't you? And these are the people through whom the Messiah came. See, you can't stop God's promises, can you? Now, I think the easiest way to look at this would be to turn to Genesis chapter I think we can just look at a few passages right here and we can glean this. Jacob's wives were Leah, Rachel, Billa, and Zilpah. Look at Genesis 30, beginning in verse 3. Actually, let's back up to verse 1. And when Rachel, this was a wife of Jacob, though not his first one, 
When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. That was his first wife, Leah, his lawful wife. And said unto Jacob, Jacob, give me children or else I die. Whoa, that is a little scary right there when you make those kind of statements and you realize what happened to Rachel moving forward when she had her second child. You know what happened? She died. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? And she said, Behold, my maid Bilha, Bilha, however you want to say it, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. And she, Rachel, gave him Bilha, her handmaid, to wife, or as wife, and Jacob went in unto her. Now, look at us what happens in this same context. But verse number 9, when Leah, there's his first lawful wife, even though he was deceived into getting her. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. So who were his wives? Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Now Leah and Rachel, it seems, were both wives. Listen to this carefully. While Bilhah and Zilpah were concubines. What is the meaning of the word concubine? It simply means a lesser wife. Now let me try to illustrate this from the book of Genesis. Go to chapter 33. Jacob and Esau spend a significant amount of time, many years apart from one another. Obviously because Esau was threatening to kill him. Right? What would you do? Think about it. So Jacob and Esau begin to reconcile, but Jacob's playing things a little safe. He says, look, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how Esau is going to take this. So I'm going to send in droves. We're going to start with the animals, but then it's going to work to Jacob's family. Now look at Genesis 33, beginning in verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. Now look. Here's the idea. A concubine was a lesser wife. Okay? And he put the handmaids and their children foremost. And Leah and her children after. And Rachel and Joseph hindermost. That shows basically the seed of his affections. He sent the animals first, and then when it started getting to it, he put his lesser wives and their children after the animals and then as it worked closer back were the ones that he really did love the most. So instead of talking about all these evil, wicked, terrible things about concubines, the simple meaning is that a concubine was a lesser wife. Now, we've talked about his father, his mother, his wives. Now let's talk about his children. According to Stephen in Acts 7, 8, Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs and at least one girl by the name of Dinah according to Genesis 30 and verse 21. But turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 35 verse 23 beginning. We see their mothers and his, their sons listed in Genesis 35 beginning in verse 23. The sons of Leah Reuben Jacob's firstborn and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. That's six isn't it? She had at least one more, Dinah, a female. Verse 24, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Verse 25, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali. Verse 26, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padan Aram. You know what I observe about this? Observe very clearly that both the priestly tribe and the, me the messianic tribe, if you want to call it that, through which of these females did the priestly tribe and the Messiah ultimately come? They came through Leah, his legal and lawful, legitimate first wife. Do you see how God does everything right? He selected the priestly tribe from which of his wives? His real wife, his first wife. The Messiah came through which tribe? Judah. The Messiah came through Judah. And 
From whom did they come? Jacob and Leah, his legal, legitimate, lawful first wife. God does right every time. Now let's talk quickly about Jacob's life. Now these Old Testament patriarchs made plenty of mistakes, didn't they? But God's plan cannot be stopped by mere men. I want to give you five D's regarding Jacob's life. Number one, on at least one occasion, Jacob was the deceiver. Go with me to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. We're not going to read all this. But look at verse 18 beginning. I think we're all somewhat familiar with this. Genesis 27, 18. And he, that's Jacob, came unto his father, that's Isaac, and he said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And look, Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. That's a lie. Isn't it? Yeah, that's a lie. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee. Sit and eat of my venison, that my, thy soul rather may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Whoops, that's a lie too. His mama did it. We're digging holes left and right, ain't we? Verse 21, And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. Verse 22, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Oh, I see a lesson. You need to trust the things that you hear and not the things that you feel. Do you see that? You need to trust the things that you hear, more specifically the things that you read, and not the things that you feel. He heard it, and he said, uh, something's off here. Come here and let me feel you. He needed to trust his ears, didn't he? Boy, don't we need to do that with religious matters? And not so much the things that we hear, but the things that we read. Don't trust your feelings in religion. You'll get in trouble. Verse 23, and he discerned him not. Because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. That's a lie. Isn't it? So at least on one occasion... Jacob was the deceiver. Now, we generally end up throwing off on him pretty hard, but remember two things. Number one, the prophecy of Genesis 25 and verse 23. And number two, Esau sold his birthright. He gave it up. He forsook it. But realize this. God does not need our help to fulfill his plan and his purposes and to keep his promises. Word number two, on at least one occasion, Jacob was the deceived. Isn't that funny? How the deceiver ends up being the deceived. Look at Genesis 29. Genesis 29. I think we're all somewhat familiar with this, so we'll just skim it quickly. Look at Genesis 29, verse 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Now, for the sake of time, skip on down to verse 23. And it came to pass in the evening that he, that's Laban, took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he, Jacob, went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Whoa, oh. You mean I've been here working seven years and I didn't even get what, I, what we negotiated? It was Leah. And he, Jacob, said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Don't you see a lesson? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't you see? When we deceive people, what do we think's coming back? We're going to be deceived. So the deceiver is now the deceived. And Laban said, verse 26, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her weak, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Wow. Number three, overall, though, Jacob was devout. When you look at Genesis 28, 10 to 15, I think we're familiar with that with Jacob's ladder. That is the promise of Abraham is renewed unto Jacob after it had already been given to Isaac. Genesis 35, verses 6 and 7, Jacob did build an altar unto Jehovah. Remember as we discussed Lot, where did Lot ever build an altar in Sodom? It doesn't seem that he did. But Jacob did build an altar unto the Lord. But I want you to turn me to Genesis 32. 
This is one of the more intriguing accounts of the Bible, and I don't presume to be able to answer every single detail of this account, but we'll just read it and see what we can figure out, okay? Genesis 32, and beginning in verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man. And when we look at Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, Hosea says this was an angel. <laughs> Perhaps it was an angel in the form of a man, but it was ultimately some sort of an angel, at least. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, that seems to be this man who is ultimately an angel was wrestling as it seems to be some type of a physical altercation. I heard a man teach one time that it was a verbal altercation. I don't really have a problem with that, but that doesn't really seem to be the meaning behind the text, does it? It looks like they were grappling one another, wrestling as it were. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Doesn't that give you the idea of they're grappling one another? That was me. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he, that's Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. So it seems that he had, he had him locked down, didn't he? He had him locked up. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now here's the point. Jacob was a devout man. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask, ask after my name? And he blessed him there. The point is, his name was changed to Israel, as it tells us. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men. And apparently the word Israel basically means prince with God. <laughs> Number four. The divine declaration made by Jacob upon his sons. You can read this at your own leisure in Genesis chapters 27, Genesis chapters 47 and 48. But look with me quickly in Genesis chapter 49. The thing behind this is explained to us in Hebrews 11 verses 20 and 21. Jacob did this by faith. That is, he was moved by God to do these things. Genesis 49, 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. That is, the last days of the tribes of Israel. The phrase last days is always governed by the context. Always. Just as any other word or phrase is. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. The fifth one, though, we'll talk about briefly is his death. Now look at Genesis 49, 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. That is, he died. Now, Genesis 49, 33 does not provide his age, but other scriptures do. Look at Genesis 47. Genesis 47, look at verses 8 and 9. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Now, that's a pretty plain question there, isn't it? And Jacob, Genesis 47, 9, said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. So in Genesis 47, 9, how old is Jacob? He says out of his own mouth. He's a hundred and thirty years. Now look in this same chapter, but skip over to verse 28. This seems to give the total number. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. 130 plus 17. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. So far as we can tell, that gives the age of Jacob at his death was 147 years old. Now third, let's quickly get to lessons for today. Are there any beneficial lessons in the Old Testament? The Bible in the New Testament says yes. Romans 15, 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. I want to suggest four words. They start with F. Number one, family. How has polygamy worked out in the book of Genesis? 
How has, how has polygamy worked out in the book of Genesis? Has it worked out well? You must be reading something else other than what I'm reading because it ain't worked out, has it? It has not worked out well. Now, what's going to happen? And it will happen sooner or later when polygamy becomes an accepted practice in this land. Do you think it'll work today? It, uh, listen, the Bible says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. What can we learn about polygamy from the book of Genesis? It doesn't work. It will fail. Hence, the rest of the scripture as it began in the beginning is true. One spouse for one lifetime. That is what it needs to be. It, to take two and three and four and five and six or even end up being like Solomon. Have somewhere around a thousand, 700, 300. How did that work out? It didn't. So when we go back and look in the Old Testament, we can see the importance of family as God designed it. And the word number two is favoritism. Didn't we see it with Isaac and Rebekah with their boys? Yeah. Now we're going to see it with Jacob's wives. Look quickly at Genesis 29. We read this at least in part. We go back to Genesis 29 quickly. And look at the language of the Bible. Genesis 29, verse number 30. And he, Jacob, went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Do you see it? And served with him yet seven other years. Now look how these two verses explain each other. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, well, did he hate her? He had at least seven children by her. He didn't hate her too bad, did he? He hated her in that he loved her less, even though that was his legal, legitimate, and lawful wife. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. How's favoritism working out in the book of Genesis? How's that working out? What did the Bible say in Romans 15, 4? For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We cannot love one child more than the other. We certainly can't have more than one spouse. One living spouse, one legal lawful spouse. I'm aware of what Matthew 19, 9 teaches. I'm aware of that. But what's the rule? One wife for life. Love your children the same. Word number three is foolishness. Polygamy, partiality, deception, death threats. Years of family separation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These fellows right here were involved in a tremendous amount of foolishness, weren't they? What's the lesson? Read this, see where they did that which is right and emulate that, but also look at the mistakes that they made and say, boys, if it didn't work here, do we think it's going to work today? It failed then and it's going to succeed today? I don't think so. Word number four is faithfulness. Despite the foolishness, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were faithful. They made some horrible, terrible, sinful mistakes. But what does the Lord remember about them? He remembers how they made those wrongs right by simply obeying what God told them to do. That's not too complicated, is it? That's not too complicated at all. We can read about the promises made by God in the Old Testament and many times where they were fulfilled. Now, while we do serve the same God, are you aware that we live under a better covenant which was established upon better promises? Are you aware of that? Hebrews 8, 6. Since God was faithful in keeping his promises in the Old Testament, we know, K-N-O-W, that he will also keep his promises in the New Testament. Do you want your sins forgiven? Do you want to have your sins washed away? God promises he'll do that, but he has given a list of requirements. And when we meet those requirements, guess what he does? He keeps his promise to wash away our sins. Number one, you got to hear the truth, Acts 18.8. Number two, you got to believe the truth, Acts 16.31. Number three, we must repent of sin. We change our minds when we've made up our minds, we change our conduct. Number four, we have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts 8, 37. But we must be immersed in water for the remission of sins to be covered by the blood of Christ. And that's the only thing that can wash away our sins. There's no power in the water. The power is in obedience to what 
the Bible teaches in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for to get into the remission of sins. And wouldn't it be nice if that was the end? Wouldn't it be nice that all we had to do was obey the gospel and then we could just die right there? Come up out of the water, take a breath, and die. But generally, that's not going to happen, is it? we got to be faithful. We have to be faithful unto death and realize that it will be through much tribulation that we enter into the final resting place of the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. We're here to help because we love you, but you have to come. Come now as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.